Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming back to Living To Do's review of Married at First Sight, Season 14, Episode Number 9, Love on the Table. Before we get started, uh, please like and share uh, this video and subscribe to this channel because I would really appreciate it. And you can also find me on Fanbase, the new monetized app that is out there under the same name, Living To Do. So let's get started with the review. I like this episode because it was dealing with adult human uh, relationships and it wasn't any uh, awkward, I mean, weirdness other than Lindsay, but even if she wasn't all that bad this episode. Um, so let's get into it and let's talk about Noi and Steve first. Noi planned a scavenger hunt, which was really cute. They seem to have um, gotten over their issues from last week where she overcooked their rice or neglected the rice altogether. Um, they got past that. They seem like they're on a path of moving forward, so I'm happy for them. Um, they discussed if they had been in love before, and Steve has been in love before in the past um not so much with her at this point because it was only two weeks which is understandable but by the end of the episode he did tell her that he did love her and it was like three weeks um they've known each other um they discussed their favorite parts of their relationship his was dancing at the wedding the wedding itself and getting um bit by the fish in uh the lake or the little water uh, area at the honeymoon and Noi needs to feel comfortable about uh, around the person that she loves of course you can't feel uncomfortable in love and you love someone so it looks like they're on a road to hopefully happiness um, they got past that issue so there's not much more to say about them I wish them well and so the next couple let's talk about Lindsay and Mark now there was a lot that really went on with them Lindsay, right off the bat, is looking for an apology from Mark. Where is Mark's apology? Where was that apology for embarrassing him in public like you did? And not one time did I hear her apologize for any of that. But she's asking for an apology. And so she wasn't getting it at first. So she was acting um, passive aggressive um, during their meal together with her one word answers you know she's full of words and uh, she could only give up one word answers to him she was calling him a Debbie Downer um, Debbie Downer I I don't see that I mean he might be a little bit depressed for what he's going through but he does put forth an effort at least in front of the cameras he seems he's cooking for her um, his demeanor when his tone towards her is not as negative as her to tone is towards him. She says that she's absorbing his toxic sludge. You're the toxic one, Lindsay. You're the toxic one. She doesn't see herself. She says she's not satisfied. He says she's not aware of what she says, clearly. And maybe that was his way of saying, uh, you know, those things that came out of your mouth um, at the bowling alley, even at the wedding. She's just so uncouth. I she doesn't, um, she doesn't feel appreciated or supportive. She doesn't know what he possibly likes about her. And he says that he knows that there's love deep inside of her. And hearing that ticked her off again, she thinks that's a dig, that the love is so deep that there's, there's no love on the surface level. Lindsay is just not listening She's not listening. She doesn't take accountability for any of her actions or behaviors. She has yet to do that on camera. We have not seen that. He takes her out um, for a dinner. Um, he tells her, you know, that's a possibility for love, but uh, she says no. She needs to be a priority, and I guess she doesn't feel like she's one. So he takes her out for a dinner. And they get along great. He orders for her. 
I hate if someone would try to order for me, especially seafood, raw seafood. And she enjoys all that. She's well-traveled. I'm sure she'll eat anything. She has the kind of the attitude of a person who would eat anything. Uh, um, and Mark just can't eat it. It's just, he can't stomach that. And I don't blame him. I don't like seafood myself, which is, I, I don't know if he doesn't like seafood. And it seems like he doesn't maybe like raw food food because not that you have to like it but when people who live on the eastern seaboard boston they have all that you know lobster and whatever have i don't know whatever else is over there and those kinds of things are like a delicacy so there's kind of expensive elsewhere and i guess it might i'm not sure but it might be cheaper on you know in that their neck of the woods there so i, I don't know if he doesn't eat seafood at all if he just doesn't like raw seafood um uh, he was in talking to her, uh, he was kind of saying, you know, he, he was being appreciative that she signed up for this process, but it was almost like, thanks for playing. It, I, I ha I'm not really sure where Mark is. I think sometimes he's just being nice, you know, uh, to save face. He seems like that kind of person, but I don't know how he truly feels about her. He though promises that he promises her that he will not cause her pain, um, and Lindsay thinks you know she, she that he's worth the effort. These uh, I think Mark and all the other guys need to thank Steve. It's something that Steve said um, in their group um, guy group that I think made the difference in all these couples. Well, a couple of them definitely Mark and um, and um, Lindsay. Um, Lindsay takes Mark go-kart riding and they also went to the batting cage because she, she said she listened. I don't know if that was assistance from the uh, producers at well, as well that he liked baseball. So they took him to the batting cage because earlier they showed that he had this old man suitcase full of, from, uh, full of baseballs from his childhood. They also did something so fun, bumper boat riding. I remember doing that as a kid, and that is one of my favorite things to do. I don't often see that, but they got to do go um, bumper boat riding, and that looked like fun. And that was pretty mi pretty much it uh, for those two. Um, the next couple we'll talk about is Jasmina and Michael. Jasmina and Michael, uh, Michael planned a picnic and gave... Uh, Jasmina a lot of gifts but all the gifts were for her dog which was considerate um, they had a discussion about how they're communicating with one another and even in this little scene there was like a little tiny tiff where Jasmina thought Michael was um, his tone was off again that it was too harsh for her and he was asking, how can or how should I communicate uh, with you? And her tone, I thought, I didn't like her tone to him because she answered, it's just basic knowledge in a rude way. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, you need to check your tone. I don't know. I think she's going to she's the one that really has problem with the tone. Um, Michael, he discussed um that his brother uh, it was the anniversary of his brother's death and he was going to go to the cemetery um and so you know it was just a touching moment he explained later what happened in fact um what he did say is later that um his brother i think his name is vladimir and they showed a picture of him with the name it, i think it said Vladimir Cadet, I could be pronouncing that wrong, but I thought, for some reason, I thought, you know, his name wasn't Vladimir, and I, a cadet, I thought, you know, maybe it was a school, so I didn't know that was his name, um, and he apparently was shot, that's how he died, um, and Michael was telling Jasmina about, uh, this, he really cried, he cried, and she tried, she wiped some of his tears away, um, and she, he explained that the grief, grief changed him because he had a lot of death in his immediate family in a, in a short amount of time. And he said that grief changed him. Um, he just kept his emotions in a box and he would just deal with it later. 
and Jasmine, Jasmina cried, um, just relating to him. And she, I just seen, she seemed like she did connect with him a little bit. Um, so I hope, uh, that they can get a little closer. I think I really like them as a couple. I think maybe they're just too hard headed right now. Um, but um, he opened up to Jasmina and he was being vulnerable and she responded. All again, this is thanks to Steve. Um, next, let's talk about um, Katina and Elijah one. <sighs> Elijah one, he asked Katina what a definition of a wife was. And she's like a partner, a support system. Um, he, he communicated to her, he didn't like that she wasn't putting much effort in or enough effort in. Um, he gave an example that they had a house party, a housewarming, and after the party, you know, he wants to clean up. That's, he's conditioned not to go to bed with a dirty home. Great. He doesn't even look like that kind of guy. And I'm just so surprised at him that that, uh, he holds that real important uh it's an important thing for him and that's great that's a you know it's a great thing to teach your kids and um you know just respect your stuff and your home and katina wanted to clean up only half the floor i, I don't know what she meant by that half the floor and see that we later find out why this is all bugging elijah on uh, he, they, the, the experts gave, um, all the couples, uh, topics to discuss and Katina and Olajuwon discussed what, what would it take to fall in love? Olajuwon said devotion, commitment, loyalty. Um, he noticed that Katina doesn't really cry and she explained that she was verbally abused and, <clears throat> and she was pretty much trained not to cry. And Elijah one says, that is a human emotion. You have to cry, you know? Um, so I think he's making little notes because <clears throat> later he mentioned that she hasn't grown up enough. She hasn't done enough living. Um, he says, when they asked, do you think you're falling in love? He said, love is not on the table. I like you, but, you know, it's not, we're not there. And Katina says, you know, there is potential. He, Olajuwon says he does not know her enough and that she hasn't met the standards. Um, there are standards, standards that need to be met. Um, and it looks like. She's not meeting them. She's not cooking enough. Uh, she's not cleaning enough. She's not putting forth the effort. He got mad that she didn't uh, do much for the party. They're housewarming. Um, that everybody else did the most of the work and she didn't even leave the house in preparation for the party in, in any way. And he noticed that and that's been bothering him. Uh at this point, I'm, he is effectively a communicating with her on a real adult level, which is very surprising to see. Um, of course, I'm sure she doesn't like all that she's hearing, and I'm sure that hurts her feelings. Um, but the way he went about it, uh, Lindsay could take lessons. And if I don't know if Olajuwon doubled up on his meds, but he needs to share it with Lindsay because it's effective adult communication at this point. Later, they take a cooking class, and uh, I guess it's to maybe to inspire her to cook. It was the kind I think it was some seafood. Um, I think it was salmon that she went. But she, they had I look like they made shrimp. Um, in his confessionals at the cooking class, he was saying he doesn't want her to wait for him. Uh, to tell her what to do. He wants her to just do it. I guess like cleaning and, um, and just wifely duties really looks like a, uh, a position that she must feel. <laughs> anyway, um, 
the cooking they're cooking together the 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 dish came out really good they ate it and he loved it um and he told her if she cooked like what they were eating that he would put three rings on her finger um he discussed to her that he wants her to work independently. He doesn't want to have to tell her to do anything. He says, you are still learning. There's nothing wrong with that. You are still learning. Um, so, um, she, he says he's ready. He bought his own home. He has what he needs to start a family, to be a husband, but she is not there. She's not doing enough. And she was started to say, what if, you know, she could have done this. And he's like, what if, could have, should have, you know, you're not doing it. And it's irritating him. He mentioned the word irritating, I think, to the boys when he spoke with the guys in the group. He wants to see where she's at as a woman. Um, she just hasn't had enough life experience. He wants to know who he's married to. And all of this talk to Katina, Katina broke and she cried. And she says, and she's wiping her tears away. And she says, it just feels bad. And she feels bad that, you know, I don't know. Maybe you're not doing, I, I don't know. Maybe she's not doing enough. And maybe he sees it and, you know, and she knows, at, you know, hearing it from him that he sees it. And, um, and he's bothered by it. I guess maybe, I don't know. I have to see what she, she didn't, all she said is that she feels bad. She never even, uh, defended herself maybe because she was in no de uh, de position to defend herself um I felt sorry for her so for someone who doesn't really cry that much and he was making her cry but it, I think he thinks it as a um <clears throat> constructive criticism but even still I guess that you know would still hurt your feelings and he went on and on so it, it never ended maybe he could have just said maybe if you can you know clean the house or clean behind yourself or we can make it a team effort where I do it one week you do it one, another week um, maybe give some ideas on how to resolve the issue as well so the guys get together they go to archery games and um Mark was there and he looked happier to be with the boys and away from Lindsay. Um, he said it's hard to figure her out. O talked about Katina's life skills and if he was in a different situation, he would have walked away from this relationship and that no difference has come over uh, Katina even after Pastor Cal spoke to them. Um, he thinks that he needs to break a tear for her to understand how, how much this means to him. Uh, Michael talked about his problems, that they're still having communication is still a problem in their marriage. Steve said um, they had a cooking issue, uh, Steve and Noy. And when Steve said that, <laughs> a cooking issue, the face, the way the editors, I don't know if that really went down the way it did or if the editors put this face that Olajuwon made. Cooking is a very strong point <laughs> uh, for Olajuwon. Um he told the guys that um, how she put their business out on public and it really hurt him. And she showed him his pain. And they, he spoke about if they, you know, if you, if they see that you're vulnerable, that they might in turn be vulnerable to you and open up, you know, um, lines of communication, a chance to grow closer in the relationship sound advice coming from Steve. Steve is an eff uh, effective communicator. Uh, he knows how to relate to people. I, that's why, you know what? That's why he's a salesman. He probably did really well. <laughs> he probably has a lot of money in the bank from it. Uh, that could be what's going on there. He was really, really good. Um, I really think that man would have no problem making money. In this episode, it seemed like all the couples were struggling with communication and, and growing together. Um, nobody was on, like, everything's going well type thing. They all were struggling. Um, the girls, they went out and had a pedicure. All four girls. Um, and it was weird. I thought something was going to pop off with uh, Katina and Lindsay. Um, when they were forced to talk to each other on camera. You know how that's always a hot button. <laughs> 
Um, they talked about growing in intimacy with their partner. Cantina said it's up and down. And Jasmina says she's a hopeful person. <clears throat> I hope you're not saying it like Alessa said she's a good person, always reminding us when you're not really. Because I don't really know, see hope from Katina. She just seems very dry. I, I don't know. She doesn't, I don't know. She doesn't really act like that, but maybe she is. <clears throat> Noitz explained that Steve loves him, loves her. He didn't tell her at this point when they went to the pedicure. He did tell her later in the episode. But at the point of the pedicure, he didn't tell her. But she says she knows he loves her. Um, when they were talking about their situation and speaking with her, um, and speaking with him, he, he when he spoke, he had a crack in his voice like he was um, holding back tears. Um and she, and he still liked her. He's still open to her, wanting her, even though they were going through a hard period. And that's how she, I think she knows how, um, you know, someone loves you when, when they, uh, when you know, when something is hard going on in your relationship and they're still vulnerable with you. I think that's what she was trying to convey to the girls. And, um, when all the guys went back, except Olajuwon, when all the guys went back to their wives and they were vulnerable, the women connected and it was um, either, it was definitely positive in all situations. Uh, and it was there, there after that, I think that's when I saw hope in all of their relationships. So, um, that was it for this episode. So um, I liked it. I really enjoyed this episode. We don't have to have all that yelling and screaming and unnecessary meanness and nastiness to one another to make a, a good episode. So uh, Mavs, this is how it should be. Keep up the good work. So that's it for now. If you please like, share, and um, subscribe, I would appreciate it. And again, you can find me on Fanbase, the new app that is out there um, under the same name, Living To Do. And I got to go because I got to do just that. I got living to do. Bye.